So it's with great pleasure that I introduce our presenter today, Dr. Alicia Main. Dr. Main is the W.J. Van Dusen Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Beatty School of Business at Simon Fraser University, where she teaches Managing Technological Innovation and Lab to Market. She's also Academic Director of SFU's Eye to Eye Program. Her research interests are in technological innovation and science and technology entrepreneurship. And at this time, Dr. Main, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Diana. It's a delight to be here. Our goal today is to try to give you some perspective, whether you are a PhD student, a postdoctoral fellow, uh, a, a faculty member, uh, or um, a, a research scientist in industry, of how developing an entrepreneurial mindset can help you as a member of the Nanomedicine Innovation uh, Network and or as uh, a scientist commercializing breakthrough inventions to better get your inventions out into the world, uh, impacting society. And I know that several of you on this call probably have already done just that. Um, but in Canada, we don't do as well as we could on innovation. We punch above our weight on invention, and too much of that great invention doesn't get out into the world in a timely fashion or building knowledge-based uh, jobs around our uh, exceptional institutions. So uh, we'd like to give you a perspective on how you as scientists, entrepreneurs, or scientists could help to give yourselves, uh, your institutions, uh, the causes you care about, and the country uh, a better chance of doing that. I also wanted to just give you a little bit about my perspective to be talking to you about this. So some of my background perspective, uh, I'm a very interdisciplinary scholar and uh, have um, been working on the commercialization of science uh, and breakthrough invention in particular uh, for 20 years now. And um, in particular, uh, I, I ended up in a business school and um, I'm, my primary affiliation is with the Beatty School of Business at Simon Fraser University. And so my publishing initially was all in uh, business journals, um, but looking at specifically science-based uh, commercialization challenges um, for breakthrough inventions that um, were taking surprisingly long times to get out into the world. And uh, so research policy, uh, R&D management. Also, uh, I started to move into interdisciplinary journals to get a broader uh, um, exposure to the types of researchers and also the types of practitioners that I wanted to have a conversation with. Again, looking at emerging industries and at radical invention, breakthrough invention, and the role that scientists, entrepreneurs could play uh, in getting the most breakthrough um, inventions out into the world. Because uh, they're a different type of entrepreneurial opportunity. Than, uh, than those that are less uh, radical. And eventually, after I got tenure and decided that, uh, that scientists didn't read management journals, um, I started a, a new strategy of trying to publish in, uh, um, in nature nanotechnology, nature biotechnology, or nature materials, areas where uh, scientists were um, actually uh, reading those, um, those, those articles, and I was publishing innovation management research in these areas. Um, they say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. I, I copied uh, a scholar uh, at MIT, Fiona Murray, who is the, now the Dean of Innovation uh, across MIT, but also a, a, a very active innovation entrepreneurship scholar in trying to, uh, to uh, have that venue for her research to be read and acted on. So I've looked at things very relevant to the nanomedicine innovation network, um, the emergence of the nanobiotechnology industry, how that happens, dominant designs, where that happens, uh, and also how one can help a venture that is spinning out of a university that has a radical uh, technology or breakthrough technology um, and challenging commercialization conditions to use um, strategic timing and other um, entrepreneurial capabilities to help give them a better chance of success. 
This particular article I actually co-authored with a venture capitalist who also had a PhD in uh, advanced materials and 30 years of experience in investing in small uh, um, uh, advanced materials and nanomaterials firms uh, at Pangea. And um, we were able to combine the academic perspective and review with his, uh, his industry experience um, to, to come up with some, some actionable um, advice for, in this case, the ventures once they were formed, but I also uh, uh, write a lot about what scientists can do before a venture is formed. So clearly, uh, there are a lot of opportunities from technology and innovation. I don't have to tell this crowd here, but there are some types that are, um, uh, that are more difficult to commercialize than others. And part of this is a language issue. We think of all of the things on this picture as being technology innovation, when some of them are, are science innovation. Um, and you look at the, uh, the nanoparticle uh, in the center or bottom of this screen, and uh, that's a much more challenging uh, invention to commercialize. So why is it more challenging? Well, one is when, when a science invention fits the category of being radical um, or breakthrough, and a radical uh, Invention is defined as something that enables vast improvements in current performance attributes to the order of five to ten times more advanced or entirely new attributes. Um, or it might uh, have a very substantial reduction in cost per unit. But it's basically, it's, it's not incremental innovation. It's, it's got a lot more technology uncertainty and often market uncertainty. Another category is with, that radical signifies deep value creation. Um, another category mentioned that's difficult, and particularly in combination with radical, is generic technology. So something that is broad, uh, uh, actually going across several industry sectors. Um, and platform technology is only across one sector, but can also uh, have share some of these same uh, challenges. So if we think about the context of the nanomedicine, um, sector, there, there could be multiple applications, uh, multiple disease indications, and also multiple delivery mechanisms that an invention is interacting with. And uh, that also um, means that there's the potential for very broad value creation. And so a research question that motivated me, and still does, but for the whole initial part of my career was how can possibly a radical generic technology with huge long-term potential for value creation not be attractive for commercialization. And so I investigated that in hundreds of firms uh, and, uh, and developed some theory uh, and summarized some of these findings in the review article that we published in Nature Materials uh, in 2016. And essentially, it's distinguishing technology ventures from science-based ventures and looking at the impact of sustained high levels of uncertainty with substantial commercialization costs incurred before that uncertainty is resolved. So when you have a sustained high period of uncertainty and you have to make financial bets that are at a high level, uh, it's a very difficult commercialization challenge, particularly for a small venture, which as we'll see, are, are more the vehicles for commercializing radical invention now than they were uh, in the decades previously. So, I mean, clearly in biomedical and nanomedicine, uh, clinical trials are a huge piece of that commercialization cost before uh, certainty is resolved. So it's not to say, as an investor, clearly uh, these areas in red, the science-based ventures are more difficult to invest in, and they may well exceed the timeline that a venture capital firm uh, actually has to invest uh, in different options. Uh, most funds have to be returned, uh, have to return their funds and close down within 10 years. Um, and you can see that these development times are often longer than that, so there needs to be a liquidity event. Um, so it's a challenging situation, but there are things that you can do particularly before the company is even formed, uh, to help better uh, allow this, uh, this sustained period of high technology uncertainty to, uh, to be um, managed 
and uh, you can think of it a lot like a real option. So here's a visual of that challenge um, and the language around it. So if we think about uncertainty, both technology and market uncertainty on the vertical axis, and time to commercialization, time from invention to uh, innovation, which means actually having it out in practice or getting revenue from it. Um, if we think about on different axes, and we think about the commercialization cost. So you've already had the invention, um, you've had the publication in, in a journal, uh, and you have probably patented at this point, but the actual commercialization cost still before you're, you're achieving revenues is what's indicated in this red circle. And clearly, science-based ventures are a totally different beast than technology ventures, even though they're often treated the same way broadly in innovation policy. And so as a starting point, as a scientist and as those who are interacting with scientists and uh, innovation policymakers, it's important to distinguish the various types of challenges and the huge opportunity that comes with science-based business and science-based ventures, as well as the ability to uh, positively impact the world around us and to meet um, uh, global challenges. So uh, this language is important, and also uh, imp importantly to understand here in Canada is that we do really well in invention in this, in this uh, zone and not well in innovation. And when asked what their major barriers to innovation were, um, leaders of, uh, of companies across the country have consistently stated over the past few decades that their top barrier to innovation is risk and uncertainty. And it's a bit ironic, you know, because with risk and uncertainty comes opportunity, and yet, if that's the major barrier to, to uh, the leaders of companies in Canada uh, to innovation, then that's something that is actually even more uh, acute when you're talking about science-based business and science-based ventures. And we need to learn how to manage that uncertainty to get comfortable managing it so that uh, we can uh, be exposed to the upside and uh, mitigate the downside. So there, there's, there's, there's academic work around this beyond my own. Uh, Gary Pisano at Harvard Business School uh, has written a book on science-based business, has written several papers on it, and, uh, and recently has been talking more broadly about how the economy has been changing. Uh, but he, divide, he defines science-based business as entities that both participate in the creation and advancement of science, uh, so they're, they're publishing, they're patenting, but they're also trying to capture financial returns from this participation, both at the same time. And they're not necessarily doing this because they're altruistic, although some of them certainly are. Um, they're doing it because the field is evolving rapidly and they need to be involved uh, with lab research and they need to have that tacit information uh, active in order to participate in those areas. So the other important thing to this group here is that science-based ventures and university spin-offs are lead actors now in, in radical innovation. And this is because corporate research labs have increasingly got out of the space of, of tier one R&D or, uh, or breakthrough invention. And they rely on alliance partnerships, on eventually acquiring startups, that have reduced some of that uncertainty, and uh, sometimes on internal corporate venturing to try to uh, watch and monitor emerging technologies and markets and then get into them when they can. But it's important to understand that, uh, that large firms uh, often are poorly equipped and organizationally equipped, actually, uh, to be able to take on a radical through technology uh, straight from the university lab, and that a startup venture is often a necessary vehicle, even if only an intermediate one. So again, just a, a summary of what's happening in Canada. Um, uh, the Conference Board of Canada you know, routinely compares Canada against our major OECD comparator countries, and we consistently over time uh, punch above our weight in invention. This is already a very high, high bar to be comparing against uh, wealthy OECD nations. 
um, and we're in the, the, the top half in terms of the number of scientific articles, in terms of their quality metrics, the top 1% uh, cited papers in the world. Uh, but when you get to even a halfway house of patents uh, and then into measures that are looking at innovation, uh, one that I like for science-based business is the number of new patenting firms founded in the last five years. Um, and those metrics we rate very low. Um, and there's certainly a longer conversation to be had about that. Um, but, you know, the reality is that over time, we're not um, actually capitalizing on the extremely high quality invention that we have uh, in our institutions. So one way to try to address this and, and a way that I advocate is to try to uh, train scientists um, to give them a uh, uh, some commercialization skills, some entrepreneurial mindset in particular. And uh, the U.S. National Science Foundation launched uh, under um, a material scientist whose name I'm, I'm forgetting at the moment, uh, but when he was the head of the NSF, he, um, he was from MIT, he put on a program, he wanted to have scientists actually um, learning about innovation skill sets and so he looked to see what was out there, looked at the lean startup, and said, let's use that uh, to help um, science teams to be able to think about commercializing their inventions. He started a program called iCorps, or Innovation Corps, which is at many universities across the U.S. right now, and SBIR, which is um, a program that will, uh, that will competitively allocate grants for commercializing inventions. Uh, that meet with the objectives of, uh, of government, of government um, agencies uh, requires um, I-Corps to have been taken before they will uh, consider university uh, companies. It's a very good program. Uh, it certainly is in the right direction for managing market uncertainty and for giving some of these skill sets, but there's a number of things that it doesn't address. Um, because the tool that I-Corps is founded on was was based on Lean Startup, which is uh, which was developed through invention and innovation in uh, IT and um, and computers. It doesn't handle the high technology uncertainty found in science-based businesses very well um, or early enough. It needs to involve more tools in managing under uncertainty. Um, the technology market fit work that's done very well with Lean Startup, uh, the market validation, is done presuming that one or two markets are already identified, whereas really for science-based businesses, more pre-formation technology market matching needs to be done. Um, and a more early IT and financing strategy needs to be linked into that. So the reason is that often, the kind of inventions we're talking about are actually a type of opportunity creation that didn't exist before and there isn't a market for. And that sort of thing is sometimes derisively talked about as technology push, but actually a great deal of the invention that's coming out of uh, our universities would fit into a category of opportunity creation. And traditional accelerators may often reject them prematurely. It may well be that taking certain strategies early on with IP protection and with organizational structure uh, and with biding one's time uh, before starting a firm, making sure that it's protected, um, will allow uh, a great deal of uh, knowledge economy growth um, as well as uh, innovation coming out of our breakthrough inventions. So to address some of these uh, shortcomings in what we're doing currently, um, seven years ago, we, based on our research, and uh, proposed to our Senate um, a program called the Invention to Innovation Program, and uh, that was going to be focused on PhD students, postdocs, scientists, and engineers that had an invention that had societal and potential economic value, uh, but very complex, uncertain commercialization. And you know, broadly, these fit into the categories of, of clean energy, uh, biomedicine. And, uh, and, you know, and, and an other category that has included quantum physics, uh, robotics, a whole range of things. And we've now been running a program for five years. 
Um, we've been running a program that's a face-to-face -face program one evening a week in Vancouver at our downtown campus. Um, and we've just started a program that is a hybrid online program uh, that is allowing uh, um, a broader range of people from different locations to be able to participate. Um, we've had a lot of success so far with this program in developing entrepreneurial mindset. And interestingly, uh, MIT, which clearly has uh, some amazing uh, programs and initiatives around uh, innovation and entrepreneurial mindset, uh, recently also turned to four credit programming, which is what we do with the Invention to Innovation face-to-face -face program. It's for credit, it's on people's transcripts. They've turned to that as well to tap into their, uh, the sophisticated thinking that goes on in the Sloan School of Management with the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Group, uh, to have that more broadly accessible to the entire university at MIT. Um, and in their new uh, Innovation Initiative 2.0, one of their big goals is to have their world-class innovation education available to every member of the university across faculties because there's silos that have been building up that they want to get over. And so Fiona Murray, um, who I mentioned was the, the scholar that I had been uh, uh, imitating in different career steps, um, she is um, uh, now teaching a course that's very much like our lab to market course um, and it is available across the university and it's really looking at um, this whole idea to impact journey um, and the early stage issues that you can look at to try to give a better chance of success later on and this is all before a company is even formed. So. There, there are a number of things that you as a scientist can do before your ventures or before the technology leaves the university uh, that are entrepreneurial capabilities that can give you a much greater chance of uh, making a, a positive impact and having uh, something successfully commercialized. And uh, these are four um, key entrepreneurial capabilities that we've found in our research um, one is technology market matching very early on. You lead with that when you're still in the lab. Um, the next is claiming and protecting the invention, choosing the founding team, and the strategic timing, both of your publishing and patenting, but critically also of firm formation. Um, in many cases, our innovation policy actually almost forces firms to, to form before it would be in their to do so in this space. All four of these are ways that um, you can, as a scientist, uh, can increase your chances of having a well-endowed venture launch. Um, and even if you don't launch the venture yourself, if it's one of your grad students, um, if it is uh, something that you are handing over the wall to another company, um, knowing about these skill sets can help you steer and guide. Uh, that invention um, uh, to a greater chance of success. So uh, technology market, ma I mentioned that all four of these are capabilities, but they're also actually processes for managing, financing, and rewarding science commercialization. It's a key innovation management capability for radical generic technologies, and essentially technology market matching is a prioritization process where at a very early stage, target markets and applications are selected and pursued. It continues after a venture is formed, uh, but the, the early stage is what's most of concern to this constituency here. Uh, suffice to say, we've written a lot of papers on this and that you need to think of the technology challenge and the market challenge at the same time. You can think of it as a pair of scissors that if those two uh, uh, blades aren't working together, you're not gonna create or capture value. Um, an example here is a, a nanomaterials startup. Um, it was a nanoparticle process uh, invention, Nanogram, um, who created possibilities across six distinct market verticals, um, but notably very, very different ones in the biomedical space, um, in, in making uh, wireless implantable uh, medical devices uh, that were longer lasting. Uh, in telecommunications, and in alternative energy generation. So these are clearly entirely different applications, entirely different sectors. 
and uh, they involve different customers, clearly, but yeah. also different clients partners. Uh, they involve different regulatory regimes. And uh, importantly and expensively, they involve very different R&D development uh, because different technology attributes are valued in these distinct uh, applications, but all based on common process innovation. So eventually, uh, Nanogram had uh, created separate market verticals um, and an IP company um, to finance these separately uh, and to manage these separately which can be uh, a solution in um, this sort of radical, generic, science-based interventions. An example in the nanomedicine space is, uh, is uh, this is out of the Langer lab at MIT, um, the invention of uh, controlled release um, uh, macromolecular drug delivery. And out of that one platform technology, 10 different ventures uh, were formed um, that are looking at different disease indications that are also uh, using different um, delivery mechanisms. And so this again is an example of, of timing and of separately launching and managing and financing uh, ventures to commercialize different aspects of a platform technology. So I'll just say as you're moving forward, that we have advice on patenting uh, broadly um, and having that strategy linked to your uh, technology market matching exploration because patenting is an essential currency of, of science-based ventures. And it, uh, the timing of that, uh, the markets that that's considered, the breadth of, uh, of patents, um, are all strategic concerns that can often be done before the venture is started. In terms of choosing the founding team, you want to think about uh, uh, having business expertise, um, whether the PI wants to be involved with the managerial process at all or just stay on the scientific advisory board. Um, typically having uh, a scientist who's a champion take on the CSO role uh, is successful in the long term. And lastly, strategic timing uh, is a way to uh, allow a venture to best match with the timing of their financing sources and uh, to, to um, be able to generate the sort of momentum once they are launched to be able to uh, um, you know, be invested in, to raise several rounds of financing, to reach an IPO. Um, but uh, that timing is also something that should be strategically managed. This is an example of uh, Bind Therapeutics and the very long timing it had from when it, the first breakthrough invention was made that was the platform technology of controlled relief, release polymers through to the specific inventions around, uh, uh, around the, the long circulating nanoparticles. And, uh, and critically, it wasn't founded until it was much closer to market and to the financing timeline necessary. Um, so again, you know, the, the, the point being that um, strategic timing and in this sector often waiting to launch uh, until there is um, uh, the sense that you will be able to have several advances in a time frame that suits your method of financing uh, can be um, very good advice. This is just to say that strategic timing, we found this, we looked at every um, nanobiotechnology drug delivery venture in North America, and the ones that IPO'd all were exhibiting strategic timing. So onto the eye-to-eye -eye program and what we do here, uh, we do look at a number of the things that I've spoken about in the Lab to Market course throughout our courses to develop an entrepreneurial mindset that both serve scientists and engineers well before they launch a venture or before they uh, try to have their technology licensed. Um, 
and also serve them very well later if they are managing the venture themselves uh, or if they're in industry and are championing innovation within industry and wanting to reach back into universities to help develop other technologies and commercialize them. And there's three big paths, and these are the, we came to the realization about a year ago that our alumni were, were following different paths uh, with the skill sets that we were trying to develop and the entrepreneurial mindset we were trying to develop. And uh, our, our three alumni today are going to talk to these different paths. Um, the first one is, you know, clearly a scientist entrepreneur path. We want to help uh, with the creation of well-endowed science-based ventures uh, to give them enhanced chances of success um, and the ability to create and capture societal and economic value. And uh, Ada Leung, who's in our current MyTax eye to eye uh, cohort uh, and part of your nanomedicine innovation network community, is going to talk to that path and her experiences. Uh, the second is a champions of innovation path within industry. And you know, here you could be a bridge to novel university inventions. You could also lead new product development in industry. Um, and you may also clearly veer from path to path. You may also become a scientist entrepreneur, but, but there's, there's, there's a path here that is being better utilized in industry and being able to unleash more of your um, leadership in this space. And uh, Jake um, Kokeni is going to talk to this. And lastly, uh, a translational scientist path. So being able to um, steer your, some of your research to have at an early stage to have more success in translational grants, but also in order to have you know, meaningful science-based research and uh, to be able to have more of an impact, if that is what you desire, in having your inventions eventually taken up while still staying within uh, a research institute. So I am going to, forgive me, I'm going to not uh, read the bios of our three alumni. They're available to you on our webinar page. Um, they're all uh, extremely accomplished. Um, but I want to give chances for them to speak to their slides and to the questions. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, first turn to, uh, to Ada Leung, who uh, has her PhD from UBC, who, has, uh, who is working with the BC Cancer Agency, who's part of our, of our MyTax eye to eye cohort, and who is a co-founder uh, of Cupris Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Ada, over to you to talk about uh, entrepreneurial mindset from your perspective. Thank you, Alicia. Okay, so I'm just going to start off with a quick background on myself. I did my undergrad at UBC and BCIT through the biotech program. And really my studies and co-op experience inspired me to go into grad school thinking of actually finding an industrial position afterwards. I did my PhD with Dr. Marcel Bally, and for those of you who know him, it's not going to be surprising that I went from being a molecular biologist to a formulation scientist. And like I said, I was always interested in going back to industry, but I really didn't expect to actually have co-founded Cupris Pharmaceuticals based on a technology that was developed at BC Cancer. And since then, I've embrace the opportunities to really learn about how to actually become a scientist entrepreneur. And that's when I came across the I2I program. And this one is the online cohort, which I'm currently enrolled in, and we're about halfway through the program. Um, and my idea going to the program is related to applying AI in formulations development. So what I really learned in the last three months is really that scientists and entrepreneurs really share many of the same traits. So we're curious, we care about good science and integrity, uh, we're driven to solve problems, resilient, and we like to take on challenges. So if you're a good scientist, you're probably also going to make a good entrepreneur. And what I really like about the i 2 i program is that it is designed to really help entrepreneurs to learn how to manage science-based ventures that have a very long development timeline. This is in contrast to a lot of the other tech-based programs that focus on commercializing apps 
or technologies that can be launched within a year or two. So research really takes a long time and we know, all know that and at every stage we're faced with a lot of uncertainties that could make or break the company. So the I2I program provides us really with frameworks on how to anticipate some of the challenges, come up with flexible strategies and continuously monitoring our progress so that we can move the venture along. So far, it has really helped me a great deal in terms of learning how to have more of an entrepreneurial mindset as a scientist. Uh, I've learned to look more and think more from the customer's perspective and go and validate my assumptions. And also to make sure that as a company, we have regular strategy sessions to manage the uncertainties that we're always facing. So as of now, I would say that what I've learned from the program is really helping me to better perform my role at Kupris. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Ada. You'll have a chance to ask Ada some questions, but I want to uh, turn next to Jay, who's at Evonik, uh, and uh, is going to tell you a little bit about his background uh, in his first slide. So Jay, over to you. Thanks. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking both Dr. Main and the organizers for giving me a chance to share uh, my story. Uh, my name is Jay Kulkarni and I'm currently a scientist at Ivonic Canada, um, which was previously Northern Lipids. Um, and how I got here was also a bit of a strange story. Um, I did co-op during my bachelor's degree, which was also the biotech program, a joint degree between UBC and BCIT. And um, I got my first placement at uh, Northern Lipids. Ended up doing uh, another two terms uh, there. And I really liked the work, the fact that it was translational. And it was very different from what we had covered um, in, in the biotech program. Uh, so then I very simply made the transition over um, into grad school with uh, Peter Cullis, who's founded Northern Lipids. Uh, and my studies there focused on uh, lipid nanoparticle systems and uh, really the biophysics of LNP formulations for, of nucleic acid. Uh, we're trying to figure out what these systems are uh, and why they form the structures that they do. Uh, and then I did a short post uh, postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Dr. Blair Levitt, here again, taking the learnings of my PhD and applying it to neurological disorders. So, it was a bit of an expectation getting my PhD with Peter that uh, you have to have a spinoff, uh, otherwise you don't graduate. So uh, needless to say, there was one spinoff that um, I'd like to just briefly discuss before I go into what the I2I -I program brought to me and uh, how it improved my, my experience of commercializing something. So on the following slide, um, the idea that I wanted to really showcase on the slide was that you know we had a goal of bringing nanomedicines and gene therapies to patients the real question was how do you do that and what do you need to know it's pretty obvious that you can't do that within a university and you just don't have the necessary speed or funding uh, and you really do need to have a dedicated team driving this forward uh, so you you know you incorporate something um, our focus was of course based on lipid uh, lipid drug delivery systems so we were kind of late to the game you know you have to navigate this ip space which uh, is is by and far the most difficult part but getting that ip is critical to valuing your company um, and so by getting your own ip you're, you you make it that much harder for uh, the next set of uh, people who are coming down the same path uh, to get into uh, into that industry so in terms of actually bringing something to patients you have to look at it from a much bigger picture. And these are things that, as a scientist, you just don't, you're not trained to think about. Um, you know, the, this concept of market research, um, adoption curves, value chains, performance tra trajectories, are nothing that I'd really um, heard of. And so the I2I -I program for me really helped me, um, which I sort of, sorry, I have on the following slide, um, really helped me put my training as a scientist um, into this process of commercializing something. And for anyone that's interested in translational research, 
EI2I program is essential. It's really a comprehensive learning tool and it's placed in the context of biotechnology. Uh, the one part that made it really uh, easy for me or really engaging for me was a lot of the work that Dr. Main's done is also based on nanotechnology. And so for anyone involved in the nanomedicine space, uh, you really can connect with the material a lot easier. The one of the other things that I benefit for, benefited from substantially was uh, the, the network you establish. You learn from entrepreneurs who have either previously been part of the program or affiliated with it in some way and what their experiences were taking something from a university uh, out into, into the market. Uh, and so that having that network is, uh, you'll find pretty important. Um, and then finally, it gives you a very well thought out strategy for how to take your idea from just an idea to something that someone can purchase. Um, and uh, that's all I have uh, for my portion. Thanks. That's wonderful, Jay. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Ada, as well. Uh, now, our third alumni is currently on a plane. Um, she has said she's very happy to answer questions uh, that you may send to her elsewise, but she has sent some PowerPoint slides with voiceover. Hi, uh, welcome to the webinar. My name is Bahar, and I'm happy to join with you today. Yeah, it's me. My background is in physics and biomedical engineering with focus on design and fabrication of micro nano size medical devices. After establishing technical expertise, I could develop my innovation idea through the I2I program. As you know, in patients with Parkinson, tumors can be extremely harmful and can reduce the quality of patient's life. My idea was a flexible patch to monitor tumors in patients with Parkinson to determine and personalize of optimal medication dosage for each patient. My product is a flexible patch R. The eye to eye program helped me to develop an entrepreneurial mindset and innovation management skill set. The program opened up new skill set and perspective. And what I learned, oh, I learned a lot through this program and it really changed my career path in a good way. Here is only the summary. So I learned how scientific research can be commercialized and how science-based innovations, um, you can view the scientific-based innovations through a business perspective, and you learn how to go beyond just thinking. You have access to a broad business toolkit and to the great professional experts and mentors. And um, you, you learn how to turn your advanced knowledge and research into innovative solutions to impact people's everyday life and how to bring your innovation to the market. I, as I said, it's just a summary and uh, you, you learned uh, a lot through this program. In my role as a commercialization manager of the Sunnybrook Device Development Lab, DDL, I help scientists and graduates to develop products from invention to market release. Skill sets I gained during the I2I program help me every day in my job. As I mentioned in the DDL, we develop products from invention to market release, and here are the steps. First, we invent new devices that never exist then make a prototype, test them, and develop a product. The next step is commercialize that research-based innovation. At the end, we bring uh, the invention to the market. I didn't have a chance today to be there for a Q&A, but uh, please don't hesitate. Send me an email and ask your questions. I'll be happy to answer your questions. And this is my email address please send me an email um, and uh, have a great day. Thank you and bye. All right. So at this point, then, we'll open the floor to questions. So, Marshall, have we got any questions yet? Yes, we have one already from Parissa Chakunian. Pardon for any mispronunciation. The question is, could you talk about challenges that regulations impose on innovation? Uh, sure. Um, 
I could speak a little bit to that, and Ada and Jay, you may want to think about it as well. Um, so I would say one challenge is that you know regulatory regimes can be very different across applications that your technology might be enabling. And that's also true in the nanomedicine space, um, or at least in the nanotechnology space that can be applicable to nanomedicine, uh, where people might choose to do something for example, uh, they may try to, to, to move to the nutraceuticals market or something that doesn't require the same sort of uh, uh, FDA regulation. Um, but in my experience, uh, regulatory regimes um, across different sectors uh, can um, make it more challenging for uh, an, a scientist to have their invention realize the value that it could enable. Um, uh, Jay or Ada, do you have something you want to add? Um, actually, I think it's very similar. So particularly if you're in the nanomedicine space, there are usually specific guidelines for um, the regulatory requirements for those kind of products and in things like manufacturing and those kind of requirements would be really important to understand before you push your product through and Maybe Jay has more to say about that based on your work experience. Only a small bit, but um, I mean, I, I would, for example, if you're developing a nanomedicine and you're taking it to clinical trials, you want to have it approved in Europe versus um, North America or, or the States, uh, you're going through different regulatory agencies. Um, typically, what you'll find is that uh, they'll have certain established standards that you're required to meet, uh, but they'll be different between Europe and, and the States. And so, uh, you know, you can, you can definitely try and build that into the design of your system uh, to begin with. I think that tends to be the most fruitful way and having someone on board who knows what those regulations are is always helpful. Um, but really, uh, you know, what you want to do is is build your or design your system in such a way that it's already meeting all of those uh, those regulations, so that you don't have to deal with that later uh, down the road or well into your um, development process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marshall. Any other questions? Yes, we have a uh, hand raised and two written questions. I'll present these in order. The first is from Frank Baum of NanoApps Medical, and his question is, what are the best resources for the funding of initial prototypes in the price range of 50 to 100,000 to further engage potential investors? Yeah, so that's a great question. And again, I'll pass it uh, both to Aidan and Jay afterwards if you have uh, additional ideas. Um, so within nanomedicine, um, you know, so there, there are. A few, it depends which side you're coming at it from. Some of the really good early translational grants I find are the NSERC I to I grant, which allows patenting as well, which is really important, and that's a hundred thousand dollar grant. Uh, here in British Columbia, the Michael Smith Foundation has a I to C grant, which they call an innovation to commercialization grant, which is has two phases to it. Uh, but the first phase, I believe, is 250000 per year, um, the second phase being higher but needing match funds. Um, I'm not sure which the best grants are in Ontario um, uh, to be uh, pursuing first. And, you know, other things that many companies find useful uh, are uh, IRAP um, early funding that you could get, NRC IRAP. Um, in, the, in this field. Um, Ada, do you have something else to add to that? Uh, you pretty much cover most of them, so I would also recommend the Michael Smith I2C program, um, and especially in the first phase because there's no match funding required. Uh, with the IRAP, if you can get IRAP funding, uh, even though it is match uh, for some of the, for a lot of the bigger programs, it's definitely good credibility if you can uh, get funding through IRAP. Next one comes from Dominic Witzigman, who asks, to all alumni, what have been the major challenges or barriers you faced during your transition? 
Ada, do you want to take that first? Sure, I'll start. Um, I think in terms of building the startup, uh, I think one of the challenges as a company is to really decide to how to take it forward in terms of um, things like strategies and business models. And, and I found the I2I program really helpful in making sure that, you know, we've we've actually been through other programs as well. And with the I2I, you find that there's actually uh, opportunities to learn strategies from different sector and be able to apply it to your own. So one of the biggest challenge that I found was uh, solidifying a business model that you will actually stick to based on what your technology offerings are. So I think the, the program really helps us in terms of coming out with frameworks and things that we can work with and being creative about how you want your business to run. I think that might be a wonderful place to, uh, to wrap up. And uh, thank you very much to all our participants. And um, Alicia, would you like to have the final word before we totally wrap up? Yeah, I, I, well, first of all, I'd like to, a, a big thank you to, uh, to Ada, to Jay, uh, and to Bahar. Uh, you know, thank you for signing up to this webinar. Uh, buy it. I think you're interested in having more impact with your inventions. Uh, and I'd encourage you to do that in whatever way that you go forward with, because um, you know clearly in the nanomedicine field, there's huge opportunity. We have world-class research going on in Canada, and I'd love to see uh, more of it getting out and making an impact.